to chair this session. Yes, good afternoon. I'm sure you had a beautiful lunch evidenced by your wanting to continue sampling the dishes that are there. Um, can we the issues which are raised by the Sama Jesse, the principal Escoven Institution, Institute of Manpower Planning and Development. He talked about institutionalization of integrated result based management and urban local authorities in Zimbabwe. Remember what he said. And the other presenter was Professor Napi from Chinoy University. He talked about integrating service level benchmarking into urban local authorities investment promotion strategy. And then the third one we had was Koli Le George from South Africa Local Government Association who talked about promoting trade and investment in urban local authorities experiences from South Africa. I think that was really quite something where he was talking about representing 257 local authorities as opposed to ours which is 32. We, we would want to see how they structured this that much. Maybe if we go back and say how much did they come up to categorize them to become municipalities, we will we'll learn something from them. We, we may probably bring in the Gutum Pandawanas, the Chivus, the, the, the Scotinis. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, trying to raise your appetite in trying to be inquisitive or not happening. Um, the floor is now yours. Can you, you ask for clarifications from these two learned friends of ours? There is nothing. There's a hand. Thank you, Pemsek. Uh, I've got two issues. One is a uh, directed to Professor Napi. It, it seems as uh, Professor Napi has got all the details uh, pertaining to non-revenue water. Um, he has got all the details for all local authorities. Is it possible that he can also come up with solutions of how best they can recover those monies that are lost. The other one is directed to, to you, PEMSEC. Uh, I'm sure you have touched the, uh, a little bit on the issue pertaining to South Africa. Uh, is it possible that um, Zimbabwean local authorities can twin with other South African uh, local authorities of, of their size so that there can be a, a, a exchange of values and exchange of issues that are, that are pertaining to service delivery. Thank you, Spemse.
There's another question, sir. Councillor Inokim Ziringa from Kariba. My question is directed to Mr. Tobile George. Um, I have liked the, your social packages aspect to less privileged, to the less privileged in areas like water, electricity, and refuse removal. Um, do you have in your budget a special injection of funds from central government to cater for that? If not. How do you come up with the uh, funding? Thank you. Question was non-revenue water what advice can you give for local authorities to recover that money which they are losing professor uh, thank you mr chairman uh, this slide before i presented on non-revenue water i mentioned that uh, sometimes what we term challenges there are actually opportunities to investors. I know that our funding is a, is a problem, and to solve part of the non-revenue water problem, you need funding. But I believe that uh, if you approach investors and show them that this is the situation, there is a funding model that has been used elsewhere where people come in and say, we can do this for you, and we save so much and we share the benefits. So it's, it could be one of the avenues. We are also aware, as CAT, we have been assisting uh, Chinoi Municipality, I think the next is, uh, is it Yusape? I'm not sure. But we've been working with the councils on water audits. Maybe we need to further this work 
on the, and build capacity on water audits and also do leak detection and repair. Right? Then the repair requires money also, which then goes back to the funding models. So I think what we need to come out with are the funding models. Thank you. Then there was another question. Mr. Chairman, can I go ahead? For the maintenance. I'm not a specialist on maintenance, but uh, I think the councils that have been working with the GIZ, they have done a lot in terms of maintenance management. And uh, other councils, I think, through the SOB platform, can learn from those councils what they are doing in terms of maintenance. But uh, what we encourage in SOB is that uh, we have set targets. I don't recall the benchmarks off yet, but they are around 5%. That should be set aside in your budget for maintenance provisions. That's 5% of your expenditure in water supply or wastewater or solid waste management. And you should have a maintenance plan. So the budget comes from the maintenance plan. And that maintenance plan through SOB visits the peer reviewers actually ask to see the maintenance plan. So I think something is happening because each visit they, they need to see it. And this year I think we started seeing them, although some of them they had been pasted a day before. But at least they are now in place. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. I think uh, that is an opportunity given to local authorities that they can present their challenges to higher an institute of learning, I'm sure they can undertake studies and come up with better options of how best you could address that. I, I'm sure that can be done. I'm sure the higher institute of learning are ready to do some work amongst ourselves because they can, that's only time when they become relevant. I think that can be done. I'm sure there should be more information coming from the University of what they are capable of doing. Now that they know the challenges, I think it is up to them to come forward and have an initiative. The issue of training, you are free to train with anybody. But with South Africa, we have got a way of training that we have through the Joint Commission. I think we have got two sessions in Zimbabwe, two sessions in South Africa, and other nations as well around, where we do joint commissions, where we talk about how we can help each other for economic reasons. I know we have got joint commissions with Namibia who have said, look here, they are short of technical people or professional people to assist them in their development. And Zimbabwe did intervene and make available 87 professionals from Zimbabwe to Namibia through this route, where we've got the architects, quantity surveyors, engineers, uh, all, all sorts of engineers, they are now working in Namibia. They finished their first five year stint, they are now on the second. So it's available for, for training, I'm sure identify a, a town from which you can benefit, provided they want to team with you too. If you are not attractive, people will shun you. But if you are attractive, people will be too pleased to work with you. So that's the thing that I think you should do. Try to shop around the website you have. Try to say what you are capable of doing and offering and what you, people can then be attracted and come forward. The issue concerning aging infrastructure, I don't know who wants to answer this but it's a yes, George. Can you? No, th thank you very much. Uh, I think the, there's two important uh, policy levers that a municipality can use in terms of managing infrastructure. Firstly, you need to have a capital investment policy framework that guides allocation of budgets for capital investment and linked to
to that is an asset management policy that will look at the asset and how to make sure that uh, the life cycle of this asset is managed properly and um, at, at also at appropriate uh, phases of its utilization. The national norm in our country is that for every budgeted assets, at least a budget from municipality must have 10% uh, uh, that is put for operation and maintenance. Before we couldn't do that, as I indicated, spending more time on rolling out uh, new infrastructure to the detriment of maintaining uh, the current infrastructure. So we have since uh, put up a national norm that for every budget there must be this allocation of 10% for maintenance. So the asset management uh, policy is important. The capital investment framework is also important. With regards to dealing with indigent policy to cater for the poor, uh, yes, we do get transfers as municipalities from the national fiscus. And in terms of our own uh, intergovernmental fiscal architecture as a country, national, provincial, and local spheres are guaranteed the share of the revenue from the Constitution of the Republic. Guaranteed. So it's not at the behest of provincial sphere or national sphere. From the budget, this share is for local government. So based on that, there is a share commonly referred to as equitable share. So municipalities receive that uh, grant every month, and on the basis of that, they are able then to develop policies to deal with the indigent uh, sections <coughs> of, the, of the population. And then you are able then to allocate these, uh, these funding uh, uh, allocations to cater for, the, for that kind of expenditure. So it's about the, the re-engineering of the fiscal architecture of, of the country in terms of ensuring that municipalities um, have a share of that, of that revenue. Thank you. That's, that's quite something where we can have some allocation from the national fiscal to support the local authorities for the poor. But I thought uh, uh, as a country ourselves we actually expect some support from local authorities supporting central government. And <laughs> <laughs> Benny? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to make a comment on twinning. I am of the very stubborn patriotic view that twins must be twins. We should uh, try and avoid going into twinning relationships for the uh, sole goal of begging for help. I would rather switch the begging to themes, e.g. a mining town in Zimbabwe can target a mining uh, twin. Uh, a, a port city like Bridge should be t talking to Dover, uh, which is a port city. Those sort of relationships, are, I think they, they create the twin that we want to be. I don't think we want to be known globally as people who are going out with begging bowls asking for help. Yes, when you do have, when you do have a, a crisis, like with the cholera outbreak, our twin city of Munich came in, but that's not the reason why the twinning was in place in the first place. The twins must be equal, exchanging uh, and complementarity. Those sort of relationships, to me, give us a better value and better pride as a country than to be knocking on doors, in, initially initiating a twinning arrangement for the simple basis of begging. I think we have our national pride to guard. So let's look around the themes. Let's look around uh, combinations. Let's look around comp complementarity as ways of entering into twin in the twinning arrangement. This country will rise again. This country, like Harare, for instance, in the past never wanted to twin with anyone other than a capital city. So Shurugi could be talking to Sheffield and saying, we are, we are, we are big in mining. Wange could be talking to a, mining, a coal mining giant. Those sort of relationships, to me, uh, I think they put us on a better br brand than being seen all over the world as begging for, for medicines and uh, used structures and things. Thanks. Thank you. I think uh, that gives us an indication of how best we can go around. I know Ulawayo had some twinning arrangement with Birmingham. I don't know whether that has died. 
or is still there. And Bulawa did benefit quite a lot from that program. I'm sure it can be done. Like what Ben is saying, find a local authority which can mutually benefit from each other. Let's not look for the rich ones so that they can support us all the time. But I think let's try and uh, have some exchange of some sort. I thank you very much on this session because I didn't seem to be seeing quite a flood of hands going up. I'm going to move to the next uh, session. Thank you very much. Can we give ourselves some... Uh, I want to thank the presenters who are here and I want to congratulate those that did not answer any questions that they had done very well in their presentation. <laughs> so can I now invite the next uh, lot of presenters who are Dr. Aaron Ndugula, Mr. Jane Mube, Katera, and uh, Chikwata. Can you come over, please, and take your place in the seat? I will probably ask the, the presenters who have just finished their session to move down to leave some room for the others. Yes. Can we give them a pom-pom so that we thank them? Thank you. Okay. George, can we move down? Okay, thank you. Um, please take seats. Um, our first presenter will be Dr. Rain Lugula from the Office of the President and Cabinet. He is going to talk about updates in doing business reforms. And the, the, the secretaries, I mean, people who are going to read uh, some small resume about Dr. Lugula from Kweke. Can you read that resume? You have got a microphone with you. I do. Uh, allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to, to talk about Dr. Ray Clinton Lukula, Deputy Chief Secretary to the President and Cabinet in the Government of Zimbabwe. He is Deputy Chief Secretary in the Office of the President and Cabinet. He has been in the civil service for the past 35 years. He has worked in the Ministry of Local Government, the Public Service Commission, and the Ministry of Trade and Commerce. Dr. Ndukula has qualifications in political science and public administration. His portfolio includes modernization and performance management in the Government of Zimbabwe, with special focus on ease of doing business, results-based management, rapid results approach, e-government, and special economic zones. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together and welcome Dr. Ray Clinton Tukula. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ndukula, sir. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary uh, for Local Government, uh, Engineer Mlilo. I don't know why you say uh, his small resume. You wanted me to put 35 years of my experience <laughs> on the uh, accordion. Uh, uh, the Secretary uh, for Local Government, uh, Engineer George Mlilo, uh, Secretary for Macroeconomic Planning, uh, Dr. Katera, uh, other secretaries who might be here, uh, Your Worship, uh, the Mayor of the City of Harare, Councillor Manyenyeni, and other uh, mayors here present, including chairpersons of uh, local authorities, uh, senior government officials, uh, the acting town clerk, 
of the city of uh, Harare, uh, Mrs. Jane Nube, uh, senior local government officials here present, development partners, business partners, ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends. I'm most delighted to have been invited uh, to this meeting uh, just to give you a brief perspective uh, of what we are doing as far as you know, the ease of doing business is concerned. Uh, most exciting uh, is the, that the theme of this local government investment conference is all about promoting investment and industrialization for socioeconomic development. Obviously, uh, we have to agree that no development can take, uh, take, take place outside uh, a local uh, authority area and uh, more specifically uh, as far as we are concerned here today outside uh, an urban uh, local authority. Uh, that is where uh, the real work is done and it is very critical that uh, we create the necessary conducive environment to make sure uh, that uh, businesses, uh, both local and foreign, can invest uh, in those areas. Um, I'll begin by indicating that uh, we are doing this ease of doing business out of, you know, the realization uh, that there is need to create a conducive environment uh, for local authorities, uh, for, for businesses to, to thrive. Uh, there is the recognition by uh, central government that uh, we need to create uh, that conducive environment for the private sector to participate in the development of the country. Uh, I want to put emphasis on the recognition that government gives as far as the private sector is concerned. We are saying the economy can be driven forward by the private sector. So you, the private sector plays a critical role as far as this is concerned. Besides the state-owned enterprises, uh, and the local authorities uh, who uh, need to be there as partners uh, in that national development. Um, in, in, in August 2015, His Excellency the President, in his State of the Nation address, was very emphatic that I am now directing you to create the ease of doing business uh, throughout the entire economy. And uh, since then, 18 months later, we are still uh, doing that exercise as part of uh, the Zimbabwe uh, agenda for socio-economic uh, transformation, that's Zimaset 2013 to 2018, and the 10-point plan for economic growth. Uh, the areas of focus as far as ease of doing business, when we started, were as follows. Uh, getting a construction permit, getting credit, registering property, paying taxes, trading across borders, resolving insolvency, starting a business, protecting minority investors, and enforcing contracts. Uh, successes have been recorded, and I want to believe that uh, when uh, the acting town clerk of the city of Harare presents, uh, you'll begin to appreciate uh, how far we have gone as far as, you know, most of these areas uh, are concerned. Well, there are other areas that we want to include uh, in future, including the energy sector, the financial, the financial sector, and so on uh, and so forth. As I've indicated, uh, we've been at it for the past one, uh, one year, nine months, and uh, I would like to indicate to you what legislative and administrative uh, areas uh, we have covered. As far as the legislative milestones are concerned, uh, eight pieces of legislation were forwarded to Parliament, and of these, the Banking Act Amendment number, number 12 of 2015, the Deeds Registry Act, Judicial Laws Amendment Act, and the Public Procurement Act have all been assented to by His Excellency the President. Additionally, a task force chaired by the Permanent Secretary for Justice, Legal, and Parliamentary Affairs was constituted to provide further impetus on the enactment of the remaining pieces of legislation. This task force's representation at the highest levels from all the affected ministries, agencies, and the clerk of parliament. Uh, let's look at some of the acts that have been enacted or are still in the process of being enacted 
For instance, the Banking Act has been enacted into law, the Deeds Registry Act enacted into law, the Judicial Laws, Ease of Seeking Commercial uh, Disputes um, has also been enacted into law. And let me indicate that uh, because of this uh, Judicial Laws, Ease of Seeking Commercial, we now have what we call commercial courts, all right? Distinct from you know other types of uh, you know courts, so we now have because it used to take um, a period minimum three years to resolve you know a commercial dispute uh, between business people and so on and so forth. But now we are hoping that with the establishment of the commercial courts, it can be done within a very limited time, say six months or so. Um, let us look at uh, the other acts. The Shop Licensing Act, uh, this is in Parliament and uh, is awaiting uh, introduction to Parliament by the Minister. Uh, the Insolvency Act, uh, again, is in Parliament. Uh, movable uh, security bills, uh, security interest bill, this has been enacted into law. Uh, and then uh, the State Administrators and Insolvency Practitioners Act. This was gazetted on 9 December 2016, and the bill is now at committee stage in Parliament. Companies Act uh, is still undergoing peer review at the Ministry of Justice, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs. Uh, the Regional Town and Country Planning Act. Uh, this is currently being drafted. And then the NASA Act. Um, uh, it has had to be revisited uh, because it was rejected. Uh, the Manpower uh, Development Act, uh, unfortunately nothing has really happened here and we are trying to prod the responsible ministry uh, to take some action. And then the Public Procurement Act, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which has been enacted into law. Uh, I, I hope that um, in the not too distant future, we shall be sitting down to look at the Public Procurement uh, and uh, Disposal of Public Assets Act, uh, what it entails, uh, what the implications are for you. Uh, because uh, what, 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 what it means is that we are now going to have, instead of one uh, procuring uh, entity like we have currently, that is uh, the State Procurement Board, we are now going to have over 200. Uh, procuring entities. Um, whether that will improve the situation in terms of quick decision making or it will enhance corruption, we don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, but obviously if you decide to do uh, corruption, we'll deal with you. And uh, again, uh, just to emphasize that uh, with the Public Procurement Act, we now are going to professionalize that area. So not every Tom, Dick and Harry can belong to uh, the Public Procurement Committee, but we'll have professional people uh, in that area. I know some of you were using office orderlies, drivers, uh, as part of uh, the Public Procurement Committee. That stops with effect from now, uh, now that we have uh, the Public Procurement Act. Uh, let us look, ladies and gentlemen, at the uh, statutory instruments that have also been identified for amendment. Uh, we've had 13, and of these, 11 have been amended and gazetted, and only two are outstanding. Uh, the toll roads, uh, state toll instrument, uh, that has been gazetted and is under implementation. The fertilizer, farm feeds and remedies, plant, pests and diseases, animal health, port health, uh, road motor transportation regulations, all these have been gazetted uh, and are under implementation. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, there was maximum uh, cooperation uh, from uh, the relevant and respective ministries uh, when we addressed uh, all these uh, issues. And then the model bylaws like uh, for, for construction permits gazetted and uh, under implementation. Uh, the general notice on the waiver of requirements to advertise for a shop uh, license that is starting a business, uh, again, gazetted and uh, under implementation. I am sure, again, uh, the town clerk of the city of Harare will elaborate and clarify some of these things. 
uh, small claims notice, small claims general amendment rules, uh, small claims uh, jurisdiction notice, uh, all these uh, under implementation uh, and have already been gazetted. Uh, as you can see, uh, the designation of magistrates' courts around the country as small claims courts and uh, there is a stipulation of new fees um, as far as you know which ones go to which court. Uh, the EMA border control regulations of 2016, the principles are still with the respective ministry. And then the national biotechnology ports of entry levy, again the principles um, are still with the uh, respective uh, ministry. Uh, what uh, milestones have we achieved uh, in the last um, 21 months? Uh, administrative mi milestones, there are quite a number, uh, ladies and gentlemen, of administrative procedures, time timelines and costs that have been reviewed and streamlined to facilitate uh, ease of doing business. There's still quite a lot to be done, but uh, we are satisfied with uh, the achievements that have been done uh, so far. Uh, dealing with construction permits and registering property, um, the city of Harare is our best example, and I think uh, Ms. Nube will explain to you what it is that they've done uh, in that area. Uh, quite a lot of uh, progress has been made, uh, she will explain uh, to you. Because we used Harare as a guinea pig, Harare is the capital city, and we felt they were closer uh, to the center. And uh, so we, we use them as a guinea pig. And uh, I must say we are quite impressed uh, with the achievements that they've done so far. Uh, starting a business again, uh, it used to be a long process, which took 56 days. Uh, I'm quite confident that she will explain that uh, now it takes them five days to actually do what was being done in 56 days. Um, Manpower registration, uh, turn around again uh, by NASA uh, from 14 days uh, to one day. Getting credit uh, with the Banking Act Amendment number 12, uh, 2015, which I alluded to earlier, um, there is now a credit registry uh, at the Reserve Bank. So at the Reserve Bank, they all know how much you owe which bank. So in the past it was easy because you could cheat and uh, pretend you only owe one bank. Now all information uh, is at the reserve bank. So if a bank, if you apply for a loan from a bank, they can easily go to the uh, credit registry and discover which other bank you owe money. This is in order to manage uh, people, uh, to make sure that uh, you don't over borrow uh, because uh, there's always a weakness uh, on our part to try and get as much as you can from the banks. Um, it's explained there, you know, what, what, what it is for. Uh, collection of uh, credit data uh, from other credit providers, such as credit stores, public utilities, and mobile network operators. So Big Brother is watching you. You are known who you owe throughout the entire system. The Reserve Bank finalized the licensing framework for private credit bureaus, and we expect all the operating institutions to have been licensed by June 30 uh, of this year. Uh, and this credit registry system was successfully deployed at the Reserve Bank and went live uh, in January of uh, this year. Enforcing contracts Following the enactment of the Judicial Laws Ease of Seeking Commercial Disputes Act No. 7 of 2017, the Judicial Services Commission has developed a work plan with a special focus on the Commercial Court and Commercial Division of the High Court in compliance with the provisions of the amendment. Central approach to the ease of doing business reforms buoyed by the achievements that are coming out of the initial uh, phase. Government has now widened the scope of the reforms to cover various sectors such as tourism and enablers, local authorities, 
Uh, the city of Harare is an example, as I've indicated, road freight and passenger transport and the export sector. The aforementioned sectors are already implementing the reforms and considerable progress has been made by these sectors except the tourism and enablers uh, sector where progress has been rather slow. However, the city of Harare and the export sector are now in the second 100 days of the reform process. The reforms are being expanded to cover other local authorities. Um, as far as the road freight and passenger transport, uh, since the commencement of the reforms in August 2016, the Minister of Finance uh, and Economic Development approved, in effect from the 1st of January 2017, through statutory instrument 16 of 2017, the reduction of duty on luxury buses uh, imported by approved importers from 40% to 5%. Coaches and Bus Operators Association had requested a reduction on duty on buses and luxury coaches, and uh, that reduction is quite drastic, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and then EMA, the Environment Management Agency, through a general notice, has adjusted the night driving restrictions from the previous 1,800 hours to uh, 0,600 hours to the recommended 2,800 hours to uh, 0,500 hours. Uh, this was a recommendation again from the five transporters. All government agencies have signed a memorandum of understanding agreeing to the creation of a single window uh, for purposes of simplifying the licensing processes, eliminate duplication, and reduce waiting time at the border and uh, operating costs. And this is effective, it's being applied. In addition, Several other statutory instruments and regulations uh, were referred to ministries, departments, and agencies for review uh, of fines, levies, and taxes affecting the transport sector. At the end of uh, May 2017, government decided to also expand the use of doing business reforms to cover the following areas, manufacturing, mining, agriculture, investment, and other local authorities. Uh, the new focus areas are as follows. Agriculture, we already have a technical working group for this. Manufacturing, uh, we had a review on the 5th of July 2017. And then mining, the technical working group uh, was constituted uh, at the end of June 2017 and it's already functional. And uh, in another 50 days, we'll be reviewing uh, what it is uh, that uh, they have done. Uh, our new areas of foc uh, focus include the harmonization of investment law, processes and procedures, and uh, we are being uh, guided here by uh, the World Bank, and uh, we have uh, a national coach uh, in place who is responsible for coordinating all the reforms that I'm talking about. And then our new area of focus, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is on local authorities, both uh, uh, urban and uh, rural because uh, we believe now is the time uh, as I've indicated all local economic development uh, happened at uh, local authority level. Uh, with regard to uh, the urban local authorities the pioneering local authority was the city of Harare uh, which commenced uh, its reforms uh, in October 2016 and they completed their second, uh, uh, their second 100 days in June uh, 2017. I'm quite confident uh, that Miss um, um, Nube uh, will cover all that area with regard to business licenses, approval of uh, building plans, uh, layout plans. Um, I, I just put this just for emphasis to uh, indicate to you, yes, something is happening. Uh, with regard to uh, the new uh, focus areas uh, on local uh, on uh, local authorities, uh, I will not go through the slide with regard to rural local authorities. You are urbanized, and we are not interested in what happens in the rural areas. So, focus more on your own area. Now, 
with regard to the office of the president and cabinet a strategic planning uh, review workshop uh, was held from 29 june to 1 july 2017 with a view to accelerating the implementation of zim asset and the 10 point plan uh, between july 2017 and april 2018 the implementation of the prioritized projects is underpinned by the rapid results approach and will be implemented using the zim asset cluster system well the rapid results approach uh, itself has been a success story, uh, especially in countries in um, East Africa, notably uh, Kenya, Rwanda, and Tanzania. Um, if those of you who have time, uh, you can Google uh, the rapid results approach and look for these three countries that I've mentioned, and you'll see what it is that they've done in a very short space of time. Um, and it's quite impressive uh, what it is that they've achieved as far as uh, socio-economic uh, development is concerned. Uh, Zim asset clusters will this August uh, undergo a rapid results initiative training and this will in essence enable them to implement programs under them within the initial 100 days. And uh, all local authorities uh, as they sit here are free to invite uh, the office of the president and cabinet because we are responsible for coordinating the uh, rapid results approach. You are free to uh, invite us uh, so that uh, we take you through the processes of actually doing uh, the rapid results approach uh, so that you can implement uh, your projects uh, in the shortest uh, possible time. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank you. I thank you. Bachelor of 
law honors degree, University of Zimbabwe. Mrs. Nobe will give us her speech now. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Session Chair, the Permanent Secretary. Um, let me also recognize uh, uh, Dr. Nkukula, uh, Deputy Chief Secretary, my Mayor, Your Worship, Mayor Manyeni, other mayors who are here present, uh, town clerks, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the, lo the urban local authorities, I am honored today to make this presentation. Um, for us as local authorities, it gives us an opportunity really to define in our own terms what we believe our role is in promoting investment in Zimbabwe. And I will also, during this presentation, share with you the challenges and the journey we have traveled as Sarare City Council in the ease of doing business and also as it relates to our special and unique position as the capital city of uh, Zimbabwe. And as local authorities, I need not overemphasize the fact that we are actually at the core phase in investment uh, because uh, I think as Dr. Nlukula says, every investor, be they local or international, they have an interface with a local authority somewhere in Zimbabwe very early in their journey uh, on investment. And um, also when we look at it statutorily as local authorities, we are empowered uh, to legislate for the control of activities in our own areas. That is through bylaws and through policies. And in so doing, we are actually shaping the investment uh, environment within Zimbabwe and within our local authorities. So um, I will now go into my presentation. Um, I will not bother with uh, the definitions of ease of doing business because I think uh, that background and context has been properly covered by uh, the Deputy Chief Secretary. I will go then to the issue of uh, lo why local authorities, why are they important? As I have said, uh, in that discourse on uh, investment, local authorities have been a missing link um, and hence the poor rating in our ease of doing business uh, index. index. And uh, like I said, as local authorities, we are determining the environment and collectively our in investment environment determines the environment for the whole country. And um, industry and commerce, they are, they are part of our stakeholders. We provide everything that they require. And we are also key enablers as the planning authorities. It is very important for us as local authorities to have our master plans, our local plans in place, because that then makes it very easy when investors come. They know exactly what they can do from where and what they cannot do. And therefore, our enabling environment is critical. And um, Zim Asset, yes, we are at the, at the core phase in the implementation of Zim Asset. And also labor and consumers, they are in local authorities. And when we implement uh, local ease of doing business in local authorities, what exactly are we trying to achieve? We want to remove administrative and regulatory barriers to investment. We want to make it easy. And I think as I present, you will see that a lot has to do also with in administrative barriers rather than uh, legislative barriers. We want to attract and promote investment and generally to encourage compliance. I think as we talk about uh, business licensing, for example, you will see that uh, a lot of the barriers or the difficulties that people face in trying to license their businesses will then result in creating barriers where they do not even bother to license their businesses. We want also to improve on revenue generation. The more investment that we get, the more money that we get, and the more sustainable it is for local authorities. I think in the morning there was a lot of uh, discussion about how we can make ourselves attractive, and um, that in itself to 
talks to sustainability and encouraging investments is uh, one of the um, steps that we take towards sustainability. We want to cut red tape because red tape encourages corruption. When we talk about, um, say, the approval of building plans, when it takes years and months to have your plan approved, then there is very fertile ground for corruption because if you do something, then someone can then approve your plan. And we are saying we need to move away from that. And then once we improve as local authorities, yes, the overall rating for Zimbabwe will go up. Um, let me go on to the experiences uh, of Harare. Harare is the capital city. Um, this is um, a unique position that we occupy as Harare, being the capital city, and it brings with it unique responsibilities. Uh, even as everyone uh, presents here, you hear them quoting the example in Harare, be it Professor Nabi or everybody, in Harare, in Harare, in Harare. And we expect that because we are the capital city. And that is why we are striving to make sure that in every aspect we move up the ladder and match what is expected of us as a capital city. Those are our unique responsibilities. Why? Because we are the first port of call for most uh, international and even local investors. They come to Harare because the market is here, the population is higher, and there are so many other things which draw them to Harare as the capital city. And when we were ranked as a country 171 out of 189 countries in 2014, um, a city of Harare, together with other institutions, we were actually told that you are the culprits. Why? Because when they were looking at uh, the procedures and processes in local authorities, they used the statistics from Harare. And therefore, immediately, we became a major contributor when the country didn't do as well as it should have done. And therefore, it was incumbent on us that we should act. And when we started being involved in ease of doing business, we started working with, uh, the at the national level, as uh, Dr. Ndukula has said. Our officers were part of the committees at the national level. They participated also in the subcommittees, and they still continue to work in those committees. And uh, through that process, it became very apparent that local authorities were the missing link. And therefore, we started working with the national level as the Harare City Council to make sure that uh, we started to introduce ease of doing uh, business reforms. The situation uh, that we had before uh, before the, the reforms. In shop licensing, for example, uh, it was very clear that more than half of the burden of uh, starting a business was as measured by doing business in Zimbabwe involved shop licensing. And um, the city council's municipal license procedures, they contributed to the bulk of those uh, steps. There were nine steps and four of those steps involved us as local authorities. We started then working together with the Zimbabwe Investment Authority and USAID Sarah, who uh, gave us some uh, technical support. And uh, this reform process continued until we started also the Rapid Results Initiative, which is a way of making sure that you get uh, your results very quickly within a time-framed period. We did the first 100 days, and then we did the second 100 days, and we are still escalating because uh, we are going now into the post one, the second 100 days phase. And uh, by so doing, we are actually institutionalizing the Rapid Results Initiative. It's now becoming a way of doing business. And unless you do that, you will not be able to achieve your results. Uh, I will not, um, I will move on to the major reforms that we have done, starting with business licensing. Uh, maybe before I do that, let me highlight the fact that as, local author as a local authority, we focused on three areas, business licensing, 
uh, the approval of building plans, and thirdly, the approval of layout plans. Not that those are the only areas, but for us, those were critical. And also, when we looked at our contribution at the national level, those were the most critical areas. And we then went on uh, to work on them. Uh, in terms of shop licensing, um, I think we heard uh, Dr. Ndukula talking about uh, the general notice which gave a waiver on um, advertising before business licenses are issued. I think you will recall that uh, it was um, a requirement that you should advertise for 45 days before any business license is issued. And that, uh, th that advert was just to inform people that we have an application uh, from Mavesera. He wants to open a bottle store at such and such a shop. And then you wait for 45 days before you can actually issue the license. Um, of course, it was, um, I think it gave good revenues to the, to the newspapers because everybody had to advertise. But there was really no benefit in it. So that we did away with it government facilitated that and it applied to us as well as other local authorities. We then went on further to say that uh, when we are approving building plans, we, the council delegated to the director of health services to carry out the inspections, satisfy himself and issue the licenses and then report in retrospect to the council. That way we no longer have to wait until the council meets at the end of the month before we give licenses. Where a person holds a business license, we know it lasts for a year, but we are saying when you already have a license, the renewal will now be automatic. We don't have to wait for you to reapply, for us to come and inspect again. It's automatic, and then we'll just do a routine inspection during the course of the year to satisfy ourselves that you still meet uh, the requirements. Three minutes. Our Three minutes. Okay, I will be there very soon. I am just highlighting some of the changes we made. Um, the licensing will take you three days. Uh, business licenses have also been rationalized from about 21 different types of licenses. We have reduced them to five. And um, you can now apply online from the comfort of your offices. Uh, building plan approval, this used to be a major hurdle in Harare. And like I said, we have now um, established what we call a one-stop shop, which means that everyone who is involved in the approval of a building plans, be it the engineer for water, the engineer for wastewater, the city architects, those who are looking at fire issues and so forth, they have a one-stop shop which meets twice a week. And in that, in that one shop, you, they will consider all your applications, and if there are no snags at all in your plan, immediately it will be approved at that sitting. That is why we were saying it can take even a day as long as your plan is compliant. And in order to, to encourage our people to be compliant, we have established a checklist of those things they should look out for. And we have also established um, a list of architects who are approved so that when you use an approved architect, the snags will be less and they don't have to keep on retaining your plan once they've considered it in the one-stop shop. Layout plans again, we have, uh, these are critical in terms of planning and we also have a one-stop shop which brings together all the players including EMA, including TEL1 and physical planning and anyone else who is involved in the approval of layout, lay, layout plans. And what they do is that um, they sit down each week and they will consider everything in one room. And this has uh, really enabled us to improve in terms of uh, the approval of layout plans. And furthermore, it has helped us very much in terms of uh, the interface with our major stakeholders. But as local authorities, there are challenges that we will encounter because we are doing a complete change in terms of mindset, in terms of culture, in terms of how we do business. You have to push the staff hard to make sure that they come out of the comfort zone of, of yesteryear. 
So lethargy and other changes and other resistance to change, those we have dealt with through RBM as has been presented. And we also need to have a built-in mechanism for making sure that we harmonize various stakeholders. It's very good and it makes your work easy when you work with your stakeholders. Communication is key and um, people have to be pushed hard. Resources have to be made available to make sure that uh, the work goes through. I would have wanted to talk more about the rapid results initiative because once you start ease of doing business reforms, you need the rapid results initiative because it helps you in terms of culture change, in terms of bringing in that new work ethic that you would like to see in employees. And in Harare, this has really given us a lot of, um, uh, a lot of progress. Uh, we were able, during the second 100 days, to produce our investment policy for the city of Harare, which has made it very easy for investors to look at it and be able to appreciate what investment in Harare means, what is required. And currently, my council is working on the incentives so that we can actually attract people to invest in Harare because there are certain incentives if you choose to invest up to a certain level. And very soon we'll be making it um, public. What we have learned, and I think for all local authorities as we go forward, High-level ownership and leadership is critical. My council was very quick to embrace ease of doing business, rapid results initiative, and once it has been adopted at the top, it makes implementation extremely easy. Communication with the private sector is critical, and during our rapid results initiative, we had people from the private sector in our various committees, and this helped us a lot. The definition of roles is very critical, um, and uh, high-level monitoring is very, very critical. And uh, what you need is a steering committee that has got the zeal that can keep people focused. Staff development programs are also critical. We've got our planners. We've got uh, other, uh, other um, uh, technical staff who have been may be entrenched in certain ways of doing things for a long time. And as local authorities, we need to make sure that uh, we can assist this uh, technical staff to make sure that uh, they move on and they embrace new ways of doing business. ICTs are critical. Like I said, a lot of uh, our uh, applicants for the business licenses have appreciated being able to make their payment uh, online to make their applications online using various uh, payment platforms. Um, so following our implementation of the ease of doing business uh, in Harare, we have shared, I, I, I'm uh, in the last uh, two seconds, we have shared with other local authorities and I'm happy to report today that uh, local authorities are all in the implementation mode but it doesn't mean that those three areas are the only ones. We are looking at other areas as well, uh, which I have outlined in, the, in, the, in my presentation, and we will be moving forward uh, as local authorities to cover those areas as well. So in conclusion, uh, we are saying without local authorities, the ranking for Zimbabwe will not improve, and as local authorities, let us embrace our role and impact in terms of uh, the investment climate in Zimbabwe. But we also continue to urge central government to strengthen local authorities, particularly in the enforcement of um, uh, compliance with uh, business licensing, because it does have an impact, not only in enforcing uh, indigenization laws, but also in the enforcement of uh, revenue collection for the central government. So we want to, I want to thank you very much for this opportunity, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It was very informative. I could have wanted to hear more from you, but with the time constraints, uh, um, I want to appreciate what you did. Um, now we want to hear from... Dr. Katera, who is going to 
I'll talk to you about the role of local local government in facilitating um, local area development for sustainable development, uh, attracting investment into local development, importance of private investment in achieving sustainable development uh, strategies that can promote local development. Move on to look at tapping into opportunities within special economic zones, then give you case studies, case reviews of China and Ethiopia, then uh, zero in on special economic zones and economic growth, and I conclude. Director of Ceremonies, allow me to give um, participants here some background to the macroeconomic policy framework. You will notice that most of the presenters have been focusing in specific areas. But us, as Minister of Macroeconomic Planning, we are the planners, we are the ones who advise government on economic policy, financial policy. So we begin by giving you, showing you the big picture, which is the forest. Where are we coming from? And we move down to the individual trees to see what exactly are we talking about. In this case, when I talk about the, the big picture, the macro perspective or the forest, I'm looking at Agenda 2063 by the Africa Union and the Vision 2040, which is what we're going to be developing as a ministry for our country. And uh, Agenda 2063, as well as the SDGs Agenda 2030, the key word and the buzzwords we're talking about is uh, leaving no one behind. Whatever we do with economic policy planning and development, investment included, we must take an inclusive approach which leaves no one behind. Under the SDGs, these are the Sustainable Development Goals, that's Agenda 2063. Relating it to this conference, we are looking at SDG number nine, which refers to infrastructure, industrialize, and innovate. Then under the global perspective of SDGs, we come down to national development priorities as guided by our ZIM asset, our economic uh, blueprint, as well as the IRISP, that is the Integrated Poverty Reduction Strategy paper that was launched last year. ZIM asset remains our national policy document that guides everything that we do in the economic field. Then below the ZIM asset, we have our national budget, We've got private sector, development partners, local and foreign investors. All of us who are working towards a common goal, that of improving the quality of life and wealth of Zimbabweans. I just thought, Director of Ceremonies, it's important that I highlight where we are coming from so that we see the big picture. Zimbabwe is not moving alone. We are moving with the rest of the global economy. We are part of the global village. So the issues we are discussing here today, yes, it's investment opportunities in special economic zones. This is not just an issue to do with Zimbabwe only, but the whole global economy is talking about special economic zones. I move on to indicate that um, uh, we have, as has been mentioned by the Deputy Chief Secretary, we had a strategic planning workshop where we're reviewing how we can accelerate implementation of ZIM asset. We came up with priority projects which we intend to implement using the rapid results approach. And all these priority projects are being guided by the economic blueprint ZIM asset and we are also focusing on the ZIM asset clusters. And also in implementing these projects, we are taking what we are calling the whole government approach, meaning to say government is discouraging the so-called silo mentality where one ministry operates in its own right, but we work together to collectively as a government. Uh, so are you, local authorities. We are also encouraging. We should not continue to operate as silos, as independent people. Let's take everybody on board. Let's work closely, especially with our ministry. Let's work closely with our parent ministry, that of local government. I'll take you to a slide which has got um, the list of the priority projects which we approved working with and through uh, the president's office.
And it is important that we take note of these priority projects because uh, these are the areas that we really believe are going to help us in terms of uh, prioritizing which investments to look at and to focus on, uh, especially as we implement using the rapid results approach. We have projects that we have put under priority one and guided by the Zim asset clusters. We are saying under food security and nutrition, uh, priority projects are development of irrigation infrastructure, provision of seasonal inputs, implementation of livestock program, tillage equipment, tractors and equipment. So why I'm talking about these projects is because what we are saying as a government is it is not the role of government alone to, to provide for these uh, projects under food security and nutrition. Local authorities, private sector investors, foreign investors, we are trying to direct you and to encourage you to focus in those specific areas because we believe as a government that these are the areas that are going to ensure food security in this country, food security and nutrition. Under social services and poverty eradication, we are prioritizing house, housing delivery, that's for families and university students. Sanitation, we are looking at water and sewage and adequate food security for children. And then coming to the cluster on infrastructure and utilities, we are looking at full exploitation of Tokwe Mkosi. You know this dam is completed and we are simply saying now work begins. What are we going to do with the land and area in and around Tokwe Mkosi? It takes two to tango, government, private sector. Local authorities, you are at the center of everything. There is no way anybody can invest in this country without working with and through the local authorities. So we would want to encourage you to direct investors, be they local or foreign, to focus on to those areas. Um, we also have uh, NRZ, we want to make sure we render NRZ functional. Uh, expansion and refurbishment of Harare International Airport, it is not yet completed. Revitalization of Air Zimbabwe, the North-South Trunk Road, that's the Churundu Bite Bridge Road. We're looking at rehabilitation of road networks and migra migration to digital broadcasting. Um, continued, we also have Kariba Hydro Expansion Project, Wange expansion, repowering of the small thermals, uh, small renewable energy projects, and special economic zones and related infrastructure. I uh, wanted to focus on the last one, special economic zones and related infrastructure. This is um, specific projects that are, have been assigned to our ministry, and this is the reason why we are here, to share with you some of the information that we have on special economic zones. And we really want to encourage as many people as possible, investors, local and foreign, to think of special economic zones because we really believe that the private sector, you the engine of growth, is, as long as we've got more private players in these areas, then we should be able to turn around to grow and develop our country. Value addition and beneficiation, uh, Director of Ceremonies, we are saying we are prioritizing cotton to clothing value chain. We are promoting chrome smelting, mining cadastral system, gold mobilization, uh, promoting um, MICE, that is, um, oh my God, the ink acronym MICE, meetings, incentives, conferences, and events, um, <laughs> incubation center project, and virtual incubation and mentoring of our SMEs. I move on to priority projects. Uh, if I keep going, I will take all the time. All I want to say is this list is going to be available to you on the website and we're going to be distributing even hard copies. So what we have done as government, working with and through Office of the President, gov gov uh, President and Cabinet, we have prioritized the projects that we believe are going to assist in turning around the economy. And we are saying don't work as an individual to say, I will mobilize, I will raise these monies alone. Let's work as syndicates, go soldiers. Let's work as institutional investors. Let's partner our local authorities. Let's partner our government. Let's partner our state.
state enterprises. Together we should be able to leverage more resources and also undertake uh, and make use of uh, innovative, innovative financing strategies for us to be able to implement these projects particularly those projects that are going to be in special economic zones. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll take you back to um, slide number four. Two minutes. Oh, okay. So, um, oh, two minutes, what do I say? That graph there is just showing that the global, is giving you the global picture about urban development. World urban population is growing up. Modernization is growing up. And with modernization, we're talking of investments. So let's, let us not be left behind as a country. The next slide, I was supposed to talk about the role of local government in facilitating local area development, We're highlighting issues that have been mentioned before that for us to be able to do so, let's pay attention to our laws, policies, and actions. In the case of Zimbabwe, the role and power of the local authorities, we've got the enabling legislation. Let's all read and understand that legislation that is the Urban Councils Act and the Regional Town Country Planning Act. We are also talking and encouraging local authorities to provide basic utilities in infrastructure and services. And like Minister of Finance indicated earlier on, issuance of municipal bonds is something that you would gladly uh, support. So these are the areas that we can uh, also focus on. I'll move on to um, what effectively attracts investment. Policy implementation. This is one of the areas where we've been lacking as government, as a nation. The way we implement our projects, also the way we're going to be implementing our special, special economic zones, it matters. Uh, this also in direction which should be done in a consistent manner without any policy reversals. Provision of competitive incentive package. Uh, this has been defined for special economic zones under SI 59 of 2017 and also in the budget statement of, um, of this year. But this is not to say this is all. We are still going through a reform process. The SEZ board has been uh, announced. The authority is to, still to be established. And government working with and through the Special Economic Zone Authority, we are also going to revamp the incentives that are going to be provided to local authorities, but taking cognizance of the fact that we must not pierce the fiscus, because the incentives actually, given the fact that we've got sanctions, we have to move carefully to make sure we do not lose too much revenue. As we implement our Special Economic Zones, we want to make sure the economy is growing, is becoming more productive, and therefore we should be able to collect more tax, more taxes. Uh, I'll skip that slide. Uh, I'll stall this one minute. Um, that uh, um, map there is just showing us the three designated areas that government is highlighted as the priority areas where we should direct our investors. Um, we have Sunway City in Harare, we've got Bulawayo, and we've got Victoria Falls. Under Sunway City, we've got 800 hectares of land for development into a medical park, office park, ICT park. What we're saying here, ladies and gentlemen, is if we're going to develop an ICT park, it does not take Dr. Katera, Judith Katera alone. We encourage, like, we have companies that are listed on the stock exchange. There are several shareholders. Can we team up and be together, establish a strong consortia, to come in with an anchor institutional investor, and together we should be able to develop a medical park, office park, and ICT park. In Blue Wire Industrial Zone, we have rehabilitation of existing infrastructure and installation of modern equipment to capacitate production, and we're also encouraging new industries. Whoever invests in Blue Wire, you qualify for all those fiscal incentives in the 2017 budget. You qualify for those incentives that are put in the SI 59 of 2017. Then in tourism, we have Victoria Falls Tourism Zone, and we are trying to promote a financial hub there. So Victoria Falls, since it is home to the mighty Victoria Falls. 
Our development strategy, ladies and gentlemen, on special economic zones, we are not going to do like a shock therapy to do one and all at the same time. We are trying to take a phased approach. Three pilot projects, gradually, special economic zones in each province, and then we scale up. For the simple reason that, like we are learning from our friends, the Chinese, they say oh, when you're crossing the river, you cross by touching the stones. We need to be cautious in our approach, and we must make sure as we give incentives, we are also reaping benefits, benefits that should accrue to the people of this country. Take example of the mining sector. Everybody knows, it's not a secret, that we allow people to import equipment duty-free. They mine, they export, they declare a loss at the end of the day. So we are saying, as long as that system sustains, there is no way government is going to be able to have enough revenue part of which revenue can also be given to local authorities, like one of the questions that has been raised earlier on. So we must protect the fiscus by growing the economy, by being more productive, by promoting investment, especially special economic zones. Um, that slide there is showing other projects that are aligned for special economic zones to say we want to promote food processing, apples, bananas, mangoes, guavas. We notice most of our juice we've been importing from South Africa. Not to say there's anything wrong with that, but why should we continue to import orange juice, guava juice, mango juice, when we also have it here? Let's find partners. Let's go into the special economic zones. Let's produce and let's also start exporting. The key word that we're using in government is whatever we do, let's export. That's how we earn foreign currency. We do not print, but we earn it. Uh, services, health services, business process, outsourcing, ICT. In manufacturing, we're promoting iron and steel production, leather and footwear, and mining, gas exploration, production, and distribution. Um, Mr. Chairman, I was going to give lessons from China, but maybe the one key word on that slide for China, I just want to emphasize their commitment to innovativeness. The Chinese will not tell you this is how we do it. This is how we used to do it. Whichever way you are doing it, try to change it. Do it differently. You will definitely yield different results. Uh, other lessons from China, um, they, they started on a first basis with Shenzhen only. And then they achieved 38% GDP growth. Uh, per capita GDP increased from $89 in 1978 to $14,600 in 2010. Now China has got many special economic zones, but they did not do things at a stroke. They did it on a phased basis. Ethiopia is another example near a home. Uh, special economic zones in Africa are also found in Nigeria and Zambia. And um, Ethiopia is embarking on rapid special economic zone development so far, they've got two special economic zones already in operation since 2014. Um, I'm worried about time now. Conclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to emphasize that as we work with and through yourselves, local authorities, private sector, government, let's take note of the fact that the key driving growth sectors in the economy are agriculture, manufacturing, mining, and tourism. In our respective local authorities, let's encourage investors to go into those sectors. As they get into those sectors, let's encourage them to go into the three designated areas. You'll find that as a ministry, we've been receiving applications from all over. People want to be everywhere throughout the whole country. The risk that we are going to run is with special economic zones, if we do not do extensive monitoring, we pierce the fiscus. We pierce the fiscus against the sanctions, then government will stop functioning. So we need a phased approach as advised by Office of the President Cabinet. If we can encourage our investors to start with those three areas, I think we would have done justice to our, to our country and to the next generation. I would also want to, uh, to, to mention that we have international, regional, multilateral, and bilateral agreements that promote trade and investment that government has signed and acceded to. Most of these agreements are housed with the Minister of Foreign Affairs. 
I encourage you, working with them through your ministry or even ourselves or Office of the President Cabinet, let's make use of these agreements. Let's take advantage of them. It, those are some of the incentives that help promote trade and investment in special economic zones and driving investment into the country. I will not conclude without talking about debt and debt arrears clearance strategy. As a nation, we are working, and as a government, we are working very, very closely, Minister of Finance leading the process. We need to clear our arrears. You know it's simple banking principles. If you do not clear our arrears, you cannot unlock fresh money, especially concessional funding. This we need to support investment in the country, including supporting our local authorities, because that's where the majority of our people are. You are much closer to the grassroots people. I also want to mention the role of Africa Trade Insurance Agency. Uh, yes, people have been talking about Zimbabwe is a high risk, political risk is high and so forth. Working with Ministry of Finance, Reserve Bank and Ministry of Industry and Commerce, we now have insurance that will protect and cushion and reduce the political premium on any borrowings and any investments. So do not accept if anybody says Zimbabwe is a high risk, political risk, country risk, because we've got Africa trade insurance agents that is helping us. We have an investment legislation. You had the Deputy Chief Secretary talking about harmonization of investment legislation. On the screen there, you see there is a list of some of the legislation that we encourage all investors, local and foreign, reading and making ourselves familiar. For instance, Immigration Act, ZIA Act, Special Economic Zone Act, the Joint Venture Act, Indigenization Act, Labor Act, PFM and Finance Act, Procurement Act, and the incoming corporate governance legislation. I'm a macroeconomist. I read legislation. So are we, all of us. It's not just for the lawyers, but we work with and through our lawyers to give us the technical, legal advice if we do not understand. This is very important, especially when you're working with foreigners. Take Chinese, for example. They may not understand what we are saying. So we should be in a position where we will be able to assist in making them understand when we say indigenization policy 5149 is for the resource sector. What does that mean? If you find yourself you're a leader and you cannot explain that, it means you're not reading, you're not consulting, you're not engaging. I just uh, want to do what I did with you. <laughs> <laughs> with these words, I thank you ladies and gentlemen for your attention. very much. It was really worth listening the whole day. It really something Judith. Keep it up. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I didn't know that uh, there was such a potential as a nation. That people are pushing to have the special economic zone anyway, even in Chivu. I think we should not discourage them. We should allow them have it in Wange, have it in, in Plum Tree. I'm told Plum Tree is, has championed the, 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 the water meters. I, I mean, they should be rewarded if there are people who want to invest in that area. I think that was quite. I want to thank you very much.
afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, all protocols observed. First, I would like to uh, extend my appreciation to the Urban Cattles Association of Zimbabwe for the invitation to share some of our research which we are doing on local government financing in developing countries. <coughs> and I would also like to recognize uh, Mr. Kolile George, who is here, uh, CEO of SAUGA. Uh, I was trained by his organization uh, seven years back when I was uh, doing my master's in local government. Uh, my presentation is going to focus on the um, local government financing and uh, particularly in the Zimbabwean context. Uh, I decided to uh, title uh, the topic uh, Repositioning or Positioning Local Authorities as Drivers of uh, Economic Development, uh, and particularly uh, Investment. Uh, I'll briefly give you a background before um, I move on to the next um, uh, part of my presentation which focuses on what I call diagnosis of the state of the problem in local authorities and lastly end with a discussion on the way forward. According to the United Nations, uh, Zimbabwe is a matured system of local government compared to other developing countries, uh, particularly in the African context. Uh, under this developed system of local government or this matured system of local government, we have responsibilities that have been decentralized to uh, our local authorities, uh, urban and rural. And we also have resource raising powers that have been given to these local authorities so that they can fund the delivery of services and other development projects. And we are all aware of some of these taxing powers or resource raising powers include, include proper rates, charges, and fees. So this is the, the brief background to the system of local government which we have, which other countries uh, like in Zambia have already coped in when they were drafting their uh, 2016 constitution, which among other things provide for a decentralized system of government. Now moving to the next section which deals with the, uh, the nature of the problem we're dealing with is that it is a fact that local authorities are struggling to raise revenue sufficient to meet their needs. Yet the pressure uh, is growing due to a number of factors such as urbanization, which has increased the demand for public infrastructure as well as public uh, infrastructure uh, maintenance. And what we see today is that budget deficits are common across the local government sector. And the result is that service delivery in most parts of our local government uh, uh, pertains, it does not meet the expectations of various communities, both in quantity and in quality. So the question is, what alternatives do we have to supplement or to complement the traditional sources of funding which are underperforming due to a number of reasons, including uh, the, macro, the macroeconomic environment we are experiencing. And my argument is that this is where investment comes in uh, to provide uh, the necessary resources which are needed to provide services and meet other development objectives. I'm not going to too much into terms of which uh, sources of revenues are underperforming and why they are underperforming. I think the more interesting part is to establish what uh, other countries are doing in terms of promoting investment at the local government levels. We have done research across a number of countries, both developed and developing, including South Africa, Mauritius, New Zealand, in terms of how their local authorities act as investment drivers. One of, the, of our key findings is that the promotion of investment, particularly at the local government level, is the dual responsibility of the national government on one hand and local government on the other hand. Looking at the national government, uh, 
the responsibility is to create a policy and legal, legal framework that facilitates inv um, investment. And I would like to commend uh, some of the initiatives which the Deputy Secretary of the Cabinet mentioned in terms of the laws which have been reformed or which are in the process of being, re of, of, of being revealed so that there is a conducive business environment. But I would like to reiterate that the creation of a conducive business environment is not a one-day issue. It's a continuous process because we are living in a global world where things are changing on a, on a vast scale, on a vast speed. And from these countries that we looked at, one of the key issues was that the legal and policy framework around investment has to be predictable. And this is one of the reasons why um, uh, Zimbabwe is ranked, uh, has been ranked uh, by a number of um, the ease of do, doing business index, low in terms of our, our, do our policies and legislation reflect a predictable uh, legal environment that instill confidence on the part of investors and other people that are interested in engaging in issues such as public-private partnerships. Then going to the local authority side, I would say that the majority of responsibility in terms of uh, investment at local government level uh, rests with the local authorities themselves. The first key issue is that local authorities should behave in a, in a fiscal responsible manner. You cannot attract investment if your financial books are not in order because you pose a risk. You cannot attract investment if you are failing to give the auditor general your financial statements for auditing. Then transparency is also important for investment. And all these things are necessary to inspire the confidence of investors. Then the previous speaker spoke about uh, the issue of credit. The key issue is whether our local authorities are credit worthy, particularly to access um, loans from international financial institutions. And both the national government and local government have got a role to ensure that subnational credit is improved. Then the next point from uh, uh, our research, particularly in the African context, showed that local government need to fully commit to exploit their financial autonomy to the fullest extent. There's always a cry that, uh, from the local government fraternity that we do not have resource-raising powers or meaningful resource-raising powers, and that's the reason why we are not able to raise financial resources that are significant enough to meet um, service delivery and development objectives. The key question is whether are you fully maximizing the financial autonomy which you have at your disposal? Because you cannot cry uh, to be given more food in your plate when you cannot finish what you have in your plate. You can't fully exploit the property rates that you have, you can't fully exploit the service charges that you have, you can't fully exploit the fees that you can get revenue from, but you want additional revenue raising powers. So the key question there, which potential investors, including those lenders, is that they look at the extent to which you are fully exploiting the financial autonomy that you have. Then the next point is that um, we need to explore if innovative or local financing measures. So the traditional sources of revenue, such as service charges, proper tax, and intergovernmental grants uh, are basically drying up due to a number of, of reasons that we, we all know. So the key question becomes, what are the mechanisms that are available for us to improve our revenue generation? And when I was reading one of the reports of the World Bank, which the, uh, the Minister of Finance alluded to earlier on, was that um, 
there is what are called is uh, daytime population. Daytime population is um, a population. Let me just give you the example of Ferrari and Miss Nui uh, already mentioned that uh, everyone who is going to talk, they're going to talk about Ferrari. Uh, let me just use the example of Ferrari. The number of people who are in Harare during the day and the evening in the evenings is different. In the morning we see significant number of people coming from all parts of the country to do their business and in the evening going back to their countries, to their respective areas. Whilst they are in the city of Harare during the day they are making use of the services which are provided by the city of Harare but they are not paying for them. The residents who are in the city of Harare are the ones who are bearing the cost of the provision of services, which is being used by other people. So the key question there is whether what mechanisms are in place to ensure that there's the revenue generation from those people who are coming during the day and going back to their cities, because they are, they, they are walking in the roads, they are using the pavements, they are making use of the water. There's nothing for free. An earlier, an earlier speaker made, made mention to that. So we need to find a mechanism ensuring that the daytime population pays for services which they provide. In other countries, uh, such external, externalities are funded by intergovernmental grants. But we know that our national government, is, at the present moment, due to the harsh economic environment, is not in a position to provide such form of grants. So it rests, the responsibility rests with the local authorities themselves to take the, the initiative, take proposals to the national government to say, this is what we have. We are thinking that we can raise revenue using these means. Then the other point which uh, Mr. Colonel George made mention to uh, earlier on was that Local authorities should be active agents of investment attraction. There is a general belief uh, around the local government fraternity that investment is a responsibility of the national government. So us, we can just fold our hands and the national government is going to do everything. Whilst it used to be the case uh, long ago, it is no longer the case. Local governments can be active drivers of investment as seen from evidence from other countries such as uh, New Zealand. So the key question then becomes, how can they be active drivers of the investment? And some of our cities or some of our local authorities have already taken the initiative. And this includes establishing um, what others refer to as investment desks, or one-stop shop where everyone who is interested in investing in a particular local authority can come and have his or her questions answered without having to go to different floors of a building or different corners of a, uh, of a building. And we can benefit from uh, the experience from uh, our neighboring South Africa, especially the eight metros. If you look at the, soon after the local government elections, you realize that all the eight metros in the inauguration speech of mayors, they made mention to the fact that they are going to establish or promote investment desks. And some of the local authorities, such as Cape Town, have gone as far as establishing that desk in the office of the mayor. This is the seriousness they are giving to uh, investment. And we also, as local authorities, need to establish or come across or come up with investment policies. Investment pol policies are basically a description of what a local authority can offer um, and the procedures which an investor has to go through if they're going to invest in a local authority. So the question is how many of our local authorities have got a policy even small which basically states in terms of what investment opportunities are available in local authorities and what an investor needs to go through to invest in that particular local authority. Then the other point which we, 
we, we established from our research was that his access to information is pivotal when it comes to investment. An investor cannot, for example, especially those who are not in, in the country, before they decide to invest in a, in a country, they do what is referred to as a background check on a particular local authority. And the background check is basically an overview in terms of the general governance structure of that local authority, the population, the revenue raising powers, the amount of money which that local authority raises, the expenditure. So the problem comes when an investor is looking for uh, a particular area to invest with or to invest in or a local authority to invest in, they go through your website, but your website is always under construction. How are they going to get this information? Again, we can uh, also learn from our colleagues in South Africa, uh, particularly the National Treasury. It established a website, um, uh, municipalgov.za. If you go to this website, it provides general governance information of each local authority. What you basically have to do is to basically punch in the name of the local authority. It will show the governance structure of that local authority, the amount of revenue which that local authority raises, the major sources of revenue, the expenditure patterns. So before you even go to a local authority as an investor, you already have the information. It's easily available. If you go on the internet now, you'll be able to access and see how City of Jobbeck raises its finances and some of its major capital investment. All that information is available. Then I'm going to take you through to uh, Mauritius, which is one of the top direct uh, countries when it comes to in attracting investment. The first thing that happens when you get into Mauritius is that an ordinary citizen already begins to sell Mauritius as an investment destination. If you are going to ask them, a taxi driver, for example, in terms of where you want to, if you want to have lunch or to have something to eat, they won't take you to the cheapest restaurant. They will take you to the most expensive restaurant. If you ask them, why are you taking me to the most expensive restaurant, they will tell you that we want you to spend more money in our country so that you can stay here. So the key question is, are we doing the same as Zimbabweans in promoting investment in our own country? Are we doing the same as local authorities employees in, pro in promoting investment in our own local authorities? Or investment is only a language which is known uh, by the mayor and perhaps the senior managers, the rest they are not aware of that term investment. So my concluding remarks uh, uh, are that employees should sell their local authorities as investment destinations. And Zimbabweans should sell their country as an investment destination. Thank you. Thank you. I still have four minutes for him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I was really enjoying the presentation. When I asked Judith how is it going, and she said, okay, she is saying most of the relevant points. And then I, I think she, she was right. Not, I'm not saying all what others have been saying were irrelevant. <laughs> I'm just saying at this moment, it fell on fertile ground. Good people, it was a pleasure really listening to all the presenters from Dr. Ntubula, the advocate Nobe, Dr. Katera, Dr. Tinashe. We really are, are blessed to have had this presentation today while we are 
to the fresh in our minds. It sets the tone very clearly for investment best measures that we have got to create in our urban local authorities. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of areas that we need to interrogate further to get clarification from the presenters. Why list I have them locked up here? You are then free unless if Dr. Ndizula wants to add something. No, okay. Katera, you want to add something? Okay. Thank you. Josephine, where are you? You're, you're fine. Okay. Uh, I, I was I felt guilty because I kept on ringing the bell. Yes. As for Tinashe, I am satisfied he surrendered on his own. <laughs> Good people, let me hear from you. The challenge I got was the investors choose where they want to invest under this SEZ. But Katera was saying they are directing them to go to Bulawayo, Sunway City, and Victoria Falls. Are you not feeling yourself deprived of investment into your, into your own centers which you are campaigning for so strongly. That is my observation and question. Yes, uh, any comments? Rosate, are you happy? <laughs> that they can go to Ulaoy Falls and Harare and leave you alone. Yes. Despite the amount of uh, groundnuts that you are producing in the area, why don't you come up with processing zones for your tubu? For your tubu? It would make a difference to your own people in the area. Anyone who has got something? Lute? I mean, with all the Madora that are occasionally found in your area, although of late we have got invaders who invade small ones, and you say, but these are not ready, and they keep on saying, these are dovi. So it, 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 it will be something, I'm I'm sure there are things of interest that you really want to say. Yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, my contribution or my question is not specifically on speci special economic zone, but uh, ideally on investment. I just wanted to, ch to ask Dr. Jokula and Dr. Katerera on uh, the aspect of uh, what national architecture do we have in relation to investment? Because we seem to not have a framework for coordinated approach to potential investment opportunities as government and as local authorities. Is there any possibility of refinement of the framework or if it is there, is there any possibility or if it, there is no framework, what is the way forward for us as local authorities? That's my question. <coughs> A follow-on question from a, again to those two, Dr. Njibula and Dr. Katera. What is your prescri prescription? What would you prescribe as a, um, a turnaround time which the government would be happy with in order to meet the expectations or the appetite and the pace of potential investors in local authorities in number of days? And to, to according to your expectations, are we, uh, to your evaluations, are we actually meeting it that at this stage? others are way ahead of us in responding to inquiries. I think those are the things which OPC is trying to address and come up with really proper
proper responses. Anyway, I'm not taking it from them. So we can go with that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let, let me answer the second. As far as investment is concerned, uh, the, the first one, I'll leave it to the, the national architect. I'll, I'll leave it to Dr. Katera. Uh, that, that, that's, that's the area of expertise. Um, you know, the, well, the World Bank uh, Ease of Doing Business Index indicates Zimbabwe at number uh, 161 uh, as of 2017. Uh, we are hoping to improve, but at the same time, uh, we've said we don't even mind, even if, it, uh, according to them, it gets worse for this year. But we are very confident that once all the you no know, relevant legislative and administrative uh, reforms that we have put in place are fully implemented, uh, we should see a drastic improvement. Uh, our, 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 our hope is that we will go uh, into around a hundred or even below. Uh, there are a lot of um, you know, reforms that we have carried out and uh, as somebody indicated this is a process. Uh, it's not something that happens overnight. So if it's a process, uh, implementation of all the uh, reforms that we're talking about will take some time. So we need to be patient uh, in order for you know, these uh, uh, reforms uh, to uh, begin to have uh, a positive impact as far as uh, investment is concerned. So it's a process. And uh, I would like to indicate to uh, His Worship the Mayor that uh, it will take time. What we are doing right now, as you can see, we are looking at the factor of time uh, in terms of decision making uh, and in terms of you know implementation of uh, whatever you know decision is made. And uh, look, uh, registering a company, reducing it as a rural city council from 56 days or 45 days is. Uh, uh, Mrs. Nube indicated uh, to five days. You know, it helps the business person to plan properly. He now knows that ah, my, the decision will be made within five days and these are the next steps that I need to do in order to start my business. It helps even a, a foreigner to make decisions. Time and again we've put emphasis on the need to have a one-stop shop uh, for foreign investors. And uh, it's very critical that uh, you know, if you go into a one-stop shop, you are able to do, you know, all your uh, processes within the hour and you're out. I've been to uh, three uh, one-stop shops, uh, one in Lusaka, Zambia, uh, quite recently, one in Singapore, and one in Malaysia, okay? They are real one-stop shops. You go in there, you go through all the necessary uh, and relevant departments that we have to go through. You know, Zimra, NASA, uh, immigration, uh, and so on and so forth. Within one building, uh, and in the case of Lusaka, uh, within one room. Okay? They are all there. You move from one to the next until you are done. And uh, if you are a local investor, uh, in the case of Lusaka, uh, you are told, come back if you went in at 10 uh, in the morning, they'll tell you come back tomorrow at 10 to collect your license. That's how efficient they are. You know, uh, in the other, in the case of um, Singapore, yes, highly efficient, highly, you know, uh, e-enabled. But uh, when I looked at it, I said, we have not reached that stage yet. Uh, it's just you go there to learn how you can, you know, quicken up the pace. We are still crawling, so we need to move at a pace that's suitable for our own environment. It was too advanced uh, for, for my liking, and I said, yes, good lesson, but not yet. All right, we'll do that later. Let's follow the examples of Zambia. Let's follow the examples of Rwanda, for instance. I'm told the Rwandan one, we had a delegation from Office of the President Cabinet. They went there, and uh, again, they saw what could be done within a day, uh, within a week, and so on and so forth. These things can be done. And uh, one of the major, major advantages is that if you e enable your decision-making process, uh, you eliminate 
90% of the corruption cases uh, that you currently have. Okay, uh, because you can make a follow through on the process, you know, online, and you can see where there are gaps, and uh, you can, you know, interrogate those gaps and uh, you know catch whoever is uh, responsible for corruption. So, in terms of turnaround, uh, your worship. You, you can't fix because we are still in the process of making reforms. But obviously, you know, capital has a uh, what can I say? You know, has a tendency, you know, to go to where there are maximum returns in the shortest possible time and in a very conducive environment. That's the kind of environment that we are trying to create uh, so that uh, you know whoever wants to invest finds an environment that's conducive, where there is quick decision, and where there is the infrastructure that they are expecting to be in place uh, so that they can invest their money. If that uh, environment is not there, capital will not come. It will go elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you. I think you did. end up with land barons. They can't wait. They want a roof over their head. I'm sure nobody is aware of this, that people can't wait when they want a roof over their head, whether there's water or sewer on the area, because of the lengthy processing that you are dealing with. You are saying you are satisfied with 45 from 50 something. Still not good enough for someone who hasn't got a roof over his head. However, on the incentive part, what do you have for these investors? Because you did indicate that you have got the people importing machinery for mining, and they come in duty-free. But these people, at the end of the day, declare losses deliberately. And you, you want to be, I want to say, you are annoyed, you want to change your, <laughs> your stance to sort them one way or the other. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the question on the national architecture, I just wish to advise that um, our ministry, working with the, through the Office of the President and Cabinet, will be going through the rapid result initiative process, where we are going by September, we are going to announce the investment statement, and we are developing an investment policy document, which will cover both local and our intention that this policy statement will be pronounced at the highest level in the country so that everybody will leave no question questions unanswered. Um, I also wish to indicate that uh, despite the fact that we don't have that in current investment policy statement, that does not mean there are no incentives in place today. If you go through any of the budget statements that have been issued by the Ministry of Finance, you find that there are quite a number of fiscal and non-fiscal incentives. But they are now scattered all over. All we want to do is to consolidate some of those policy incentives. For instance, those who are also investors here, you are aware that government can also grant what we call national project status to some projects. And when you are importing equipment, we facilitate working with and through Zimra. And duties are not required to be paid for, and investors are given grace periods up to five years where they don't pay any, any taxes. So we now need to come up with one good, solid, comprehensive investment statement and investment policy document, which we intend to do through the Rapid Results Initiative and deliver by September. And um, I think that's what I can say for now. And maybe to add on to what the Deputy Chief said about the one-stop shop, um, we have been attending a workshop in New York uh, uh, on SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, where the global economy is saying whatever we do, including the one-stop shop investment center, it is not about the physical building, it is about the ICT. Everybody is going and embracing ICT, such that if we, for example, working with through the various agencies that are represented at ZIA. You complete your
your form once, your information is on the database. You don't have to repeat. And investment pro approval process must take much shorter time. Yes, we may be targeting to say, let's approve within five days. But who says it can't be done in a day? Who says it can't be done within an hour? So with the development uh, developments taking place in ICT, we want our ZIA to also embrace ICT as we embark on this one-stop shop investment center. So we are working towards that as a government. I thank you. Thank you. I think this is... This is Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. There are quite a um, lot of things that are happening from what we, we hear now. But um, our feeling as uh, local authorities and also from the recent experience that we have had with engaging in tho with those uh, ministries and agencies that we have engaged with is that the participation of the local authorities themselves in the whole process is very, very critical. Because at the end of the day, the investor you are quoting from China, from Japan, from wherever, will land in Gokwe. And it is the local authorities that will actually assist in, 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 in availing that, that environment. So they must appreciate it. So the policy making process, for example, it is critical that the local authorities we here are directly involved in that. Because central government, once we separate central government, from uh, local government, then we have a problem because se local government must implement everything that's done, but they're implementing something that they did not participate in in, certain, in in some of these issues, while in other issues we are very involved and very happy. We also are looking at when, we're, when there are delegations that discuss with investors who have come to Zimbabwe, if local authorities are represented there, then the, even the, the government, uh, the, those who are in central government who, are, who will be the bosses there, are informed of what actually is on the ground as they discuss. So that at the end of the day, what comes out is what what's, is implementable. What seems to happen is when investors come, they then get to the local authority, they find things that are slightly different, and they, they quit. When there are visits on benchmarking, visits on look and learn in terms of investment promotion. We, we feel that if, as local authorities, we are also represented there, it becomes easy in terms of coming back and sharing with others. When you now want to have this uh, done on the ground, it becomes much easier than when you then have another step where those who went will now come and try and uh, educate or tell those who, 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 left, who were left behind so that they, they will implement. I think if we learn from what we've done with the IRB, we have had difficulty in implementing it. But the moment OPC and the local authorities worked with the local authorities directly, it's a, a, a failed fire now. Ease of doing business, a failed fire because of that direct uh, communication and link and, and, and um, participation. So that's our plea, Mr. Chairman, as, uh, as urban local authorities, looking at the relationship between central government and its agencies and local authorities in terms of working around the issue of investment promotion in the country. The logic is one of the platforms that we have now with local authorities and government. I'm sure from the experience and comments that we get, Lucas on its own or the forums by the executives, they've revolved around allowances for themselves without addressing key issues which promote development. I've got to be very open with you. This is the impression that we have because we have not seen a single proposal from UCAS which talks about opening windows or doors for development. It's a question of can, can our allowances be a little bit up? I'm very sorry. I'm, if you
you want me to keep quiet, I'll keep quiet. But it is very important that we address the issues correctly. This is the, I enjoy this forum very much because you are talking live issues which grow the economy. Unless we do that ourselves, be critical of what we are doing, we will not move as a nation. We will not move. I am actually provoking you to come up with things that help us come better. I know I have been having fights with everybody. The whole, every week I turn down applications for wanting to go to, to Egypt to go and see how a prepaid water meter works uh, uh, with about nine officials accompanied by 12 councillors. And we say, really, these things can easily be demonstrated on the, on the screen, how they operate. Are we taking advantage of the IC innovations that are there? I, I, I'm, I, I'm throwing it over to you so that now we can address it realistically. Deputy Chief. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm happy I'm not a councillor. Um, well, with regards to the involvement of, um, you know, local authorities uh, in the, like, for instance, ease of doing business and policy investment, we, we right from the start, uh, we, you know, committed ourselves to make sure that, uh, you know, local authorities are part and parcel of the decision-making process uh, in terms of the way forward. This is why, uh, in my presentation, I did indicate that uh, we utilized uh, the city of Harare as our guinea pig, deliberately so, because we knew that uh, once we had started with Harare, we would move from Harare to the next uh, lot of urban local authorities, and then from there to, the, to the rural district councils. And we, we've, we've actually had meetings uh, with uh, some urban uh, local authorities. I think we had a meeting in Bulawayo a few months ago, as well as uh, a meeting with uh, rural district councils, all, all, all as a way of uh, trying to introduce the ease of doing business uh, and uh, using the rapid results uh, approach methodology uh, to implement the, uh, the decisions. Um, for instance, we, we are having visits uh, to uh, special economic zones in China at the end of this month, and uh, we've invited uh, the local authorities in those areas uh, where, uh, which were identified by Dr. Katera is where we are, you know, s uh, promoting special economic zones. So we'll be having officials from Arare, from uh, Vic Falls, from Bulawai accompanying us so that they go there and appreciate what it is when we talk about, you know, special economic zones. Uh, be rest assured that uh, as we spread uh, the whole uh, you know, idea of special economic zones. We definitely will also involve, um, you know, other, you know, local authorities, but uh, not uh, in big numbers as indicated by Engineer Mlilo. Thank you. I just want to find out how the ease of doing business speaks to the Joint Ventures Act. Well, you know, there, there is definitely a symbiotic relationship between uh, ease of doing business. Look, we're trying to create uh, a conducive business environment for all the PPPs, uh, the joint ventures that you're talking about. Uh, without that conducive environment, you really cannot talk about, uh, you know, investment, isn't it? And uh, JVC is a part and parcel of investment into a conducive environment. So there is a relationship. Uh, while we are coordinating as Office of the President the ease of doing business, you know, reform agenda, uh, when it comes to uh, the approval of joint venture companies, uh, that's the responsibility of 
the Minister of uh, Finance and Economic Development. All right. So even if, um, for instance, Victoria Falls Town Council want to go into venture with the um, Mosia Tunya Development Company and a Chinese company called CMEC, uh, if they create a JVC, uh, that JVC will go through the normal processes uh, of being approved uh, by not only the Special Economic Zones Authority, but also by the Joint Venture Company Unit that resides uh, in the uh, Ministry of uh, Finance uh, and Economic Development. We are still starting. Obviously, if we see that the process is too slow, we will have to improve our act to make sure that decision-making is quickened. As you can see, I've already mentioned quite a number of uh, you know, responsible ministries. And if we see that uh, it's too slow a process, then we'll have to improve our systems in order to make sure that decision-making is um, made as quickly as possible. But definitely there's a relationship between uh, uh, the ease of doing business and uh, the JVC. But uh, take ease of doing business as the foundation. Huh? We're just laying out a foundation, both as government and local authorities, in order for business to come in and engage and invest uh, in our environment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at uh, 9.40, if time is going to be maintained, Mshai, who is the director for joint venture unit in the Ministry of Finance, will be here talking about opportunities in the joint venture program, the PPPs. It's going to be addressed fully by one who is actually running with it. Yes, Josephine, there was a hand. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairman. I just wanted to comment and say, uh, in respect of um, uh, uh, what can I say, cooperation or consultation between local authorities and central government, I think now it's at an all-time high. Because uh, previously it was unthinkable that we would actually interact and interface with OPC at the level that we are. And I think we have um, had an opportunity to make inputs into the amendments to the Regional Town and Country Planning Act. Uh, we have also made inputs into the, uh, a lot of input into the Procurement uh, Act amendment and also the Licensing Act amendment comments on the investment policy and uh, on rapid results initiative, for example, as Arare, as we were carrying out our first and our second hundred days, we invited all local authorities um, except those that are very far away. A lot of them came and lent together with us. But what I think we need to do as we go forward, perhaps is to have a regular and um, uh, platform where there can be more uh, involvement of local authorities at an organized level. But I think as of now, we have really moved from zero to a very high level in terms of uh, that interaction. Thank you. Uh, then on the land baron say, it's more of greed, not uh, delays in implementation. That's why it's the same land barons who sell land in Mavuku, are the very same ones selling land in uh, in, in, in Budiriro. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, the proposal that there should be more interaction between government and local authorities, it would help. It would help as long as we don't try to run away from each other in trying to address issues. Any further questions? Yes, there is somebody there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, in fact, I wanted to ask maybe two questions. Uh, maybe the other one maybe might uh, uh, anger some of us if we are here. How they come up in fact, with uh, choosing maybe uh, on the, on the uh, special economic zones, how they come up with the, these two, um, the three cities, Harare, Plawai, and Big Falls. Uh, I'm a little bit worried maybe because if you can see that it's like a, in Manika land there, that's the gateway to the sea, but we don't have such a, such a facility for it. So I say, why, why all those things are there inland, except maybe for big force, but there is much, in, except for tourism, only for the of, I mean, So I'm saying, how did they come up with that? Then on the other issue was uh, on the 
importation of equipment for mining, they say that uh, most of them they will declare nothing maybe to the government if it's copy. Uh, how, if it's especially like look at uh, places, maybe sorry, maybe to mention that word, a place like uh, uh, it's an example uh, like Chiazwa. We can see all the departments, government departments are there. And then at the end of the day, we've got Zimra people, we've got, uh, I mean, uh, all you, I mean, you can mention. There it seems me, 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 except me, me representing the government. How come at the, at the end of the day, they will say they've made a profit, I mean, a loss. Are we putting people who are not I mean, really, I mean, I, I, I don't know, I mean, oh, we don't know anything about the, I mean, the processes I mean, will be I mean, happening I mean, uh, in those areas. She has just a, 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 a cheap, I mean, example. But I know we've got more places where those people are. Uh, I, I think maybe, I mean, uh, yeah, which people didn't have mentioned the word, I mean, something like corruption. Are we saying there's an element of corruption where some people are, are benefiting instead of the government to benefit? Do yeah. I think that is very, uh, I like your first question where you say, why have they selected the three episode, episode area? Yes. Why? 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 Why didn't we pick on on Rutape? Why didn't we pick Mutari for its timber? And why didn't we go to Lupani for its hardwood and develop that industry? Uh -huh. It's up to you. I mean, I, 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 I'm provoking you to think about the area. I don't see why Bite Beach cannot come with some donkey meat processing. <laughs> It's highly valued. <laughs> you go, for instance, to China. Donkey meat is being sold at fifteen dollars fifty a kg, and beef is being sold for four dollars thirty. You see where the <laughs> Doctor I, I was I was just going to say, look, um, if if you listen carefully to what uh, Doctor Katera said. She said that in China, when they started with the uh, special economic zones, focus was on one area, Shenzhen. Eh? They just picked that area and said, look, uh, because of its proximity to, to, to Hong Kong, um, and uh, you remember Hong Kong was a former British colony, and uh, it had developed systems and it become really capitalist. So they thought that if they put it close to um, uh, Hong Kong, Shenzhen would develop fast, and it did. You know, uh, from lessons learned uh, with the business uh, models that were being carried out in uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, in our case, um, you know, the, the first priority that we looked at was Sunway City. If you recall, Sunway City has been uh, in, in, in our books for quite a long time. Um, and uh, Sunway City, if it's developed, is going to be one of the best uh, techno parks uh, in the whole of Southern Africa. Uh, there are quite a number of uh, industries that are earmarked uh, for, the, uh, for, 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 for that uh, uh, special economic zone. And uh, we then, after that, uh, looked at other challenges that we have. Uh, Big Falls, it was identified as having a potential uh, for tourism uh, and uh, business, uh, you know, what do you call it? Uh, business investment or uh, a financial hub, all right? Uh, so, because tourism uh, is a money spinner, uh, it's a low-hanging fruit. If you invest uh, properly, you can recover your money as quickly as possible. Honorable Mzebi has been talking about a $5 billion, you know, um, tourism, you know, turnaround. Uh, and uh, I think uh, if uh, we invest in Big Falls in tourism especially, uh, we are most likely going to see, you know, turn around as far as uh, tourism is concerned. And Bulawayo uh, identified, if, if you recall in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and early 80s, Bulawayo was the industrial hub of this country. And uh, because of challenges, uh, that uh, reputation has gone. But uh, the whole idea being, look, there are industries in Bulawayo. Why don't we we focus on them and try and revive them, hence the choice of Bulawayo. But please be rest assured that uh, this is only the beginning, and uh, we are hoping that 
four local authorities will actually learn from the three that we've picked and see how it is um, that they can speed up the process uh, in investing uh, or in attracting foreign direct investment for themselves and then create their own niche. Uh, already we've saved timber uh, from Manikaland, isn't it? So we can create a special economic zone around timber in Manikaland and export uh, uh, all the timber uh, in a processed form uh, rather than in a raw form like what we're doing. Uh, look at the, um, the, 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 the stone that we are uh, you know, exporting in raw form from Toko huh? and is taken to Italy, China and so on and so forth, polished and uh, you know it's of high value when it's polished. It's not that we can't you know, do the same thing here in Zimbabwe. So these are the things that we need to transform. Each and every area, each and every local authority in Zimbabwe must, at the end of it all, have a special economic zone. But we are saying, let's start uh, somewhere. And uh, this is exactly what we have done. And we hope that uh, in the not too distant future, we'll be talking a different uh, language altogether. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. There was a hand somewhere in the center there, at the corner. Unless if your question has already been answered. Um, <clears throat> my question was on uh, Dr. Gatera's presentation on the special economic zones, but I think it's been answered through the uh, question here at the back. But I was going still to ask and uh, put it across the house that we all know, as we all know, that uh, in English we say first impressions last longer. A visitor coming through any one of our border towns and finds the town uh, a junk town will definitely think otherwise. Someone may say, okay, I'm going back because I think Harare will also be the same. Why not uh, consider our border towns like Bike Bridge, the busiest, the other towns like Plum Tree or Chirundu, also as economic, uh, special economic zones, so that we can be assisted in uh, actually making impressions to any visitor? Because it's not all the visitors who fly in. A serious visitor on investment will definitely drive in to see how the country terrain is, to see for himself. So why not uh, consider the border towns as special economic zones? So that, uh, as Dr. Chikwata put it, we can be able to sell our local authorities as investment destinations. I retire my question. Thank you. Um, I, I think, uh, like you rightly said, that your question has already been answered. Dr. Ndugula said, for a start, they wanted to try these three, and then from success of those, it will then go to other areas. I thought that's what you wanted to say. So, yes. And the other question it was Chikwata. What were you, what did you say that interested Papa there? Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> the example which I gave was uh, that one of uh, Mauritius, where it's a responsibility of every citizen to sell their country as an investment destination. So the question is, is what can we do here in, in Zimbabwe to um, sell the country as an investment destination, but also take it further to sell our own local authorities as investment destinations. And I believe that uh, uh, the speaker there will just um, uh, raise the question around the need to establish special economic zones in uh, border towns is sort of like doing uh, some action towards uh, uh, selling his local authority as an investment destination. 
So such initiative should be encouraged to ensure that uh, there is investment in different parts of the local authorities. And the other key issue is that <coughs> the issue of investment is that we are not only competing uh, for scarce resources with other countries. When investment comes to Zimbabwe, there's also going to be competition among local authorities to also get uh, the investors. So at the end of the day, what matters is uh, who is providing the most attractive environment. And as for me, that's a good competition because you cannot cry for to be an investment destination, yet you are not improving the conditions in your own local authority for investors to come. So if they, all the investors are going to go to Harare, to Vic Force, or to Mtare, and not to other local authorities, that shows that there's something good they are doing. And we then need to do a critical assessment in terms of other local authorities, in terms of how we can match the standards of those local authorities, or even outperform them. That's what, we, that's what we found out when we did our research on local government financing in, in other countries. It's a continuous competition. It's a continuous review of the business environment through the necessary policies and uh, legislation. Thank you. Yeah, there is a hand on that side. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, um, I picked a number of things from uh, the different presentations, uh, Dr. Kaderera uh, and Dr. Chigwata. Dr. Kaderera talked about the idea of the whole government approach. And uh, from Dr. Chigwata, uh, we talked about the legal and policy framework being predictable. Um, from Dr. Katera's point of view, it would appear that uh, by saying we want to take the whole government approach, we are saying that all arms of government must participate directly and indirectly in promoting investment in the country. My question is, uh, what role is uh, the national law enforcement agents uh, playing in assisting in creating the legal and uh, policy environment in the country to make sure that the investment climate in the country uh, is indeed predictable. Uh, this question is really perhaps also best understood in the context of um, the land barons that we're talking about and the activities which we think are indeed very detrimental to investment in the country. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Katera, you've been cited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair. I hope I understood your question very well, but I'll try to respond to your question by uh, recapping on my experience from Ministry of Finance. Uh, you are aware that Ministry of Finance administers the Anti-Money Laundering Act, and uh, quite a number of, in fact, all our law enforcement agencies, they work with and through using that act. And uh, we are developing regulations that will make sure that any proceeds of crime will be confiscated and people will be prosecuted if you are involved in any, for example, illicit financial flows. Uh, so we are a country that respects and we are saying we do not want any money laundering. If we are engaging investors, we want investors who come to this country with clean money. We do not take investors who come with dirty money, for example, money and through human trafficking, drug trafficking, and uh, other illegal activities. So our law enforcement agencies, 
will be really on your back. If they catch you, we are going to be prosecuting. And the regulations will be pronounced very soon. I'm not sure if that answers you. But we want to make sure we have clean investment in the country. Let, let, let me just indicate that uh, I, I think we, we need to appreciate the fact that uh, in order to ensure you know, transparency and accountability you know, within the system, uh, more specifically as far as investment is concerned, the government of Zimbabwe has put uh, in place a number of oversight institutions. Uh, she has cited one, uh, the police, but remember you also have um, parliament itself. Parliament is there to make sure that uh, things are done according to uh, rules and regulations as enacted by parliament and assented to by His Excellency the President. And within uh, Parliament itself, there are a number of uh, committees that they have created, uh, and these play a very critical oversight role to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, investment, utilization of public funds uh, is done in a transparent and uh, an accountable manner. You also have uh, other institutions like um, the Anti-Corruption Commission, isn't it? It's in place. Uh, to try and uh, minimize, you know, corruption within both the public and private sectors. So a number of institutions have been created uh, to try and ensure that uh, we, we minimize uh, corruption. And uh, it's, it's quite uh, healthy that uh, people are now talking about, you know, the whole issue of corruption, you know, openly. Uh, and that way, you know, it can be dealt with, unlike in the past uh, when uh, we tended to want to pretend that uh, there was no corruption, uh, and yet it was apparently there. You know, if uh, I wanted to, he gave us the example of Mauritius. Um, I wanted to give the example of uh, Singapore. Singapore, if you land uh, at the airport and get into a taxi, the taxi driver, by the time you, you, you get to your hotel, he will have told you a lot of things the population of the country, that is a multi-ethnic society, uh, and that uh, he will tell you about inflation, you know, at what level it is. If it's 3%, he will tell you our inflation now is at 3%. And uh, one thing that they always talk about is that we are proud and that we are a corruption-free you know, society. Everybody will tell you that. All right. Uh, and by the way, they don't tip. They, there are no tips. Uh, uh, like what you do here, everywhere you go, everybody wants a tip, you know. Uh, but uh, they no tipping, nothing. And, and the taxi driver will tell you exactly the same statistics that you get when you get into a government office. You know, people have been trained. And uh, I don't see the reason why if, if Mauritius, Singapore and other countries can do it, why we can't do it ourselves. Uh, it's something that can be done. Uh, but uh, at, at one fora, in fact, we're reviewing the 200 day. Uh, I uh, actually highlighted the fact that, you know, most of the things that we see here, like, you know, dirty streets and all that kind of thing, it's really us. It's in our head. It's what we want. It's an attitude. There's nothing to say that, no, we can't. Look at what the people did uh, a few days ago, cleaning Harare. If we had that kind of attitude, do you think that Harare would be dirty? Do you think any local authority would say there is paper everywhere? But it's in our heads, it's an attitude. And we say, ah, no, we live with it. So we, we really need to think hard as to you know, how do we attract investment into the country. Uh, but uh, we can create that conducive uh, environment if, if, if we change our mindset and say that we want to make uh, Zimbabwe great again. Thank you. And then um, it's becoming very interesting. Although I've got a, a heap of questions I want to raise, but should I raise them, Doc? Tomorrow. I'm told tomorrow will be the day. However, there are some which you must sleep over and come tomorrow a little bit prepared. The question I have trying to dodge Parliament. What you say? Parliament has summoned me to come and go and answer Mr. Mayor Bulawayo. That why is Bulawayo using a generator instead of using Zesa? And I've tried.
tried by all means to be either sick <laughs> to avoid the confrontation because it's a very difficult one for me because the environmentalists are worried about the ozone layer and economically wondering how you get your fuel from it raises other questions to say, how does Bulawayo access fuel? And uh, how would they go for diesel generator as opposed to... Because as a farmer, a lot of farmers tried to go diesel generators or diesel farms. They found it very difficult and thought Zesa was the ultimate. But how does Bulawayo have this? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair. I wanted to ask a uh, few questions, but as unfortunately some of them have been covered. I've got only one question. Um, I'm from Victoria Falls. I think we all agree that council, local council, um, uh, they are drivers of economic and development, and um, we have a challenge. In Victoria Falls, we know that tourism, or Victoria Falls is the hub of uh, tourism. Um, we, if I'm not wrong, Victoria Falls is the highest uh, municipality that is being charged a lot of money by Zinwa to pump water, only raw water. And um, uh, the second thing, we as local authorities, we are being squeezed by some of the government parastatals to get raw water just in Zambezi River. As Victoria Falls, we are neighboring other countries like Zambia, Botswana, they are using the same river to get water. But the amount of water, um, amount of money that we are paying to Zinwa, it's a lot. Secondly, uh, Victoria Falls is one of the seventh wonders of the world, where we have got a number of tourists coming into the country, and that benefits the whole of Zimbabwe. We are not getting anything from the falls. Tourists, they are coming in daily, if we want to develop Victoria Falls, if you want to communicate with other countries, the whole world, to say this is Zimbabwe, we need to make sure that Victoria Falls is clean and we have got enough resources to develop our area. We don't have enough land to have industries. The land is finished, so my point here is I'm currently asking uh, the House to think about what is coming from the falls. If our local authorities get even 1% so that we can develop our area. I think this also same applies to, to Wange, where we have been getting a lot of call for all these Yes, I don't know whether it's one local board if they're getting a share or even 1% from what we are getting from those areas. I thank you. Um, thank you.
very much. I think there are, there are a lot of questions. I'm sure the House will raise quite a lot of them. Why don't you put those in writing and submit them to Secretariat and we can get well thought out responses to your satisfaction? I'm sure what you are raising is very pertinent, but it needs a lot of time to go through it. So I think if you put it that down in writing, I'm sure even Secretariat, you can dictate to them, they can take it down for you, and then they can then pro send them out to appropriate authorities to deal with it. I mean, this is logic, where we want to deal with issues that hinder our investment drive. We want to unlock it. That's the purpose. And people should not feel ashamed of anything. Say it out, it may help the other local authorities. And then this is very key. On issues of water, very key. Issues of power, the one you're talking about, of the royalties or whatever it is, it's very important. I'm sure the state will need to look at it. In the morning, the BP did talk about the issue of vehicle licenses. It's very, it's very vital. But we can't answer it here. It must go to the right decision makers to look at it that people have read pronounced something which needs to be addressed because it's very important to keep on thinking keep on coming out keep on provoking we will end up with something Jeff, i can assure you it won't be a waste of time it won't be a waste of time the next year's logic we are going to probably bring more people who will answer a lot of pertinent questions even the professors I know Professor Nafi he enjoyed himself today when he was presenting. And if I if I had allowed him all the time, he would have talked all day long because you were very attentive on what you are saying. And that's an encouragement to a professor that children are not stupid. <laughs> yes. uh, I want to to hand over to Manyanyani that I have done my small stint there and the your matata. I want to thank you. Can we clip clip some hands for us for me? <laughs> Another one for me. <laughs> uh, it's been a very fruitful day, I believe with all the deliberations and the presentations I do not really wish to uh, waste any further of our time uh, going back to what has already been said ladies and gentlemen I just want to to say thank you for uh, having a very fruitful day today just uh, to let you know that as we said earlier we were streaming live on our Facebook page that's the Eben Councils Association of Zimbabwe Facebook page, and our views have been very encouraging. Just like what happens in Parliament, when Parliament is live on television, people uh, whom you represent will be watching you, making your contributions. And today, uh, the official opening ceremony had 643 views. We were not able to ascertain where exactly they were coming from, but we believe it's in and outside of Zimbabwe. And then we had 143 views before lunch, and just now this session had 189, and uh, we are counting. That's uh, views, that's people who are actually connected to the live stream. So your contributions, everyone is seeing them here and outside this auditorium. I also want to remind all of us, if you have not registered, please do so. Go and register today outside there. Tomorrow we are going to add more desks so that our registration exercise is done expediently. And uh, after this, we are going to have a cocktail, and this cocktail is sponsored by Utility Systems. And uh, tickets have been left at each local authority's stand. You are also reminded that this cocktail is attended strictly by invitation. Allow me at this juncture to call on Ms. Uh, Dorothy Mavolwane. She's also, again, going to lead in the presentation of gifts to those who are here at the talk table. We will start
start with the Deputy Chief Secretary to the President Cabinet. That's Dr. Nlokula. Some of the gifts here, they are in various sizes. I think they depend on how much time they took during their presentations. I'm worried about my brother here. <laughs> and the next is Dr. Katera. Thank you very much. Next, Mr. Kolile George. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tinashe Gwata. Professor Napi. She's coming to claim hers. Followed by Mr. Saman Jesse. And finally, Mrs. Nube. Well, that brings us to the end of today's proceedings. We'll be back here tomorrow. Let's all be in the auditorium at exactly 8 so that we are on time and we move with the time. We have uh, partners who failed to make their presentations this afternoon. We kindly ask that you are in the auditorium first thing tomorrow so that we can allot you some time to do your presentations before everyone else. And uh, that being said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much and let's meet tomorrow. Have a pleasant evening.